Oh, and then one other thing before we go into just like a little bit of grounding. Um, Kate, could you plop in the chat about the live transcript? Thank you. Okay. Um, welcome everybody. I uh, really appreciate y'all making the time to hang with us. Um, I wanted to start, my name is Tiffany Brown. Um, I wanted to start with just a grounding to help us land um, and set a little context for the energy and intention that we're trying to set for our time together. Um, I ask that if you're comfortable um, for people to close your eyes, um, or you could also turn off the video if you like, and um, to take a couple of deep breaths and to feel your feet on the floor, if that's comfortable for you. And for you to feel a deep rootedness Go all the way down to the depth, to the core of the earth. And then we can shoot our energy up into the realm of dreams and imagination. And I'd like for us to envision an economy that works for everyone. What does that feel like? What do the streets look like? How does your community feel? What's the quality of the air you breathe? How does the land look? What's the news that you hear in this world where we're living with an economy that works for everyone? And if you can just take a couple more breaths and hold the feelings and the smells and the colors. And then as you're ready to come back, you can open your eyes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so again, welcome. I'm Tiffany Brown, I know many of you. Uh, I co-founded Cordata Capital Investment with a Backbone with Kate Poole, who is holding down the tech stuff today. Thank you, Kate. Um, and we're an anti-capitalist investment advisory practice. We only invest outside of the stock market and in investments that center racial and economic justice. Um, and then a shout out to Natural Investments. Um, Natural Investments uh, is the RIA, Registered Investment Advisory Firm, that Kate and I are a part of. Um, we're independent advisors, but a part of this platform. So I wanted to spend a few moments setting the context for our time together. And the best way that I could think about doing this is through story. Um, so I met Angie Kim from the Center for Cultural Innovation, who you'll hear from, um, at the very beginning of 2020. And we were at this conference in Mobile, Alabama, hosted by our friend Jessica Norwood of Runway. And this event was centering the leadership of Black women in building Wakanda. So Angie and I became fast friends <laughs> over her love of sporks. 
Um, and anyway, Angie asked if Cordata would uh, join as an ally to CCI, Center for Cultural Innovation. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So one of the events that they hosted was actually a webinar for this project, Gilded, which is why we're all here today. And um, CCI was invested in Gilded. And as part of that presentation, um, Esteban Kelly spoke. And Esteban and Kate go way back to Philly Connections and um, both living on a land trust and then serving on the board of that land trust. And so anyway, I felt like a real like level of, of comfort and um, in, in good company and was also just absolutely blown away by the work of Gilded. So I gushed about it to Kate. Um, over the course of the past year and a half that Cordata has been offering these webinars, um, we've learned a lot about the role we wanna play in supporting the next economy. Uh, there's a relational aspect of our work, and then there's this infrastructure piece. And as you can tell, we're super passionate about relationships. And um, so one of the ways that we kind of like got to this point is actually through leaning into the relationships we have. So shout out to folks who have been a part of the cohorts that we organized, Lena, Joe, um, and, we kind of like dreamed with our community towards this webinar. So I guess it's noting that it's both like critical and exciting to activate this web of interconnection to support the infrastructure that's needed to build the next economy. Um, we're honored to play a role in what we dream and imagine will be the great success of Gilded. And I'm eager for you to learn more about why we're excited. Um, quite simply, Gilded provided me a glimpse into this project where freelancers could get some of their basic needs met, access to health benefits, legal and accounting services, and a guaranteed payment pool. Um, at different points in my life, this offering would have been invaluable to me. And the idea that workers can pool together through this platform and resource themselves is amazing. And I find it so amazing that I've truly been like moving on spirit to organize this webinar so that our community could hear from Gilded and to help them succeed with the, uh, the philanthropic capital that is needed to grow this. So to kind of just paint a picture of like how we'll flow today, uh, first we'll hear from Angie Kim, um, and then we'll hear from Esteban, um, as Gilded is a project of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. And then the framing and the nuts and bolts uh, will be a Jekka Williams. Um, and then we'll hear from a freelancer, Justin Franks, who's part of Gilded. Uh, we'll have small, brief breakout rooms and wrap up with Q&A. Um, and then as a follow up to this, this is like almost like a reminder to myself. So anyone feel free to email me after the fact, but we have this whole folder that's like a one pager on Gilded and wiring instructions, but it's kind of just like everything that's needed um, to deepen your relationship with this project. Uh, and with that, I will pass it on to Angie. Thanks, Tiffany. And thank you, Tiffany and Kate for bringing everyone here together on a topic that's near and dear to me, not just about Gilded, but just overall in terms of me talking and providing some context about why Gilded is one of the biggest investments that we've made, which is just how do we create new infrastructure, new service um, entities, new systems that support people in, um, who basically have been left behind by existing infrastructure. And so um, Tiffany shared that it would be helpful to talk a little bit about why we made this investment and the social problem that we're seeing that they are helping to uh, provide a solution to. So the organization that I run and I'm joined by um, Kate and Nicole on this call who are also uh, on our team is that uh, it's called Center for Cultural Innovation. And we're known within the nonprofit arts um, sector for supporting artists primarily, but we actually have a larger focus about on supporting everyone in the arts and creative and uh, entertainment industries 
writ large. So that makes us really keen on looking at the social and economic issues of the overall arts labor market. And that takes us away from just like supporting artists because they do great projects. It actually gets us right into the hot seat of, okay, what are new solutions to expand the social safety net to include them? So we all know COVID-19 hit con this country March, 2020, but in 20, January, 2020, we had actually embarked on commissioning a research report um, uh, conducted by Urban Institute on what will be the impact potentially of the AB California, for those of you who are in this state, California's AB5 legislation that is meant by progressives to actually cover the needs of freelancers and gig workers, many of whom are artists. And then quickly when COVID hit, it was also an opportunity to just look at the overall kind of failures of the uh, existing social safety net. And as just kind of a reminder, and it's at this point a no duh, but it's just worth saying that for us, the connection is so many artists are freelancers. They are facing unstable work conditions, but their conditions are not alone. More and more Americans are facing unstable, unprotected and unsupported work, right? And so thinking about just, well, we just need to put more people into unions doesn't really work when we have an economy that depends now so much on freelance unfettered labor. And so um, when we uh, worked with um, Urban Institute, we had already invested significant capital um, in the general operating support of Gilded's uh, startup phase. But what was really interesting to us was when this seven person Urban Institute team started working on the recommendations uh, part of the report, the research report, um, they, they, I will just say, frankly, they came back to us and had very sort of typical responses like, well, we need more unions in this country. We need to give workers more power. And I kept pushing them and saying, what does that look like? And the researchers said to us, we don't actually really know right now. And I said, well, look at Gilded, look at, you know, and I gave them a few, a handful of um, uh, options and they were blown away, truly. I mean, these are people who have a national perspective and they said, oh, to do collective and cooperative arrangements to collectivize political power potentially and be an example of a portable benefit, that is amazing. So the Gilded is actually mentioned and cited quite extensively in the final Urban Institute report. And I'll put that report in the chat. So anyhow, I'm, I, don't want, I didn't wanna go into the details of Gilded, but I wanted to just backdrop that this is not just a nice pie in the sky kind of endeavor um, that we are signed on to, what we are really seeing is these are exactly the kinds of solutions that need to get supported today in order for us to fix things that are problematic now, but also for the reality that our economy has completely shifted away from old fashioned or conventional ways of thinking about worker protections. So let me turn it over to Esteban. Awesome, thanks so much, Angie. Um, I might actually pull up some slides. I think Ajaka has some slides about Gilded and, and maybe I'll use that as part of a tool for saying a little bit about, about um, the Worker Co-op Federation and, and the work that we're doing to, to incubate Gilded. Um, but first I just want to say hi. It's so good to see some familiar faces and people who I've seen recently and other people who I haven't seen in a very long time. Um, so hello. <laughs> I wish we were all together, like in someone's living room, drinking wine or something. Um, I'm feeling that. So my name is Esteban, uh, and I am based in Philadelphia. Uh, still, some friends who used to be based in Philly are, are here, and I, I miss you all. Um, I've been the executive director for the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops since 2015, and working on this freelancer co-op initiative since 2017, or maybe 18. Um, and just to back up a little bit, so part of what we do, we're the only national grassroots membership-based organization for worker-owned cooperative businesses in, in the U.S. Um, I'm also on the board for the International Worker Co-op Federation. I mean, these things are all connected, and, and it's part of how we get to scale is through those networks and, and 
relationships and um, and how they kind of can scale through fractal iterations. Um, but we have uh, members that are in all different industries, almost every sector of the economy um, from coast to coast here in the US. And yeah, there's a little map of that. Um, and we, a lot of our members are really concentrated in California, New York, Massachusetts, um, but, but are otherwise spread kind of all over. Um, there's certain local areas like in Southern Wisconsin, for example, that are even denser than parts of um, California in terms of where uh, our, our members are concentrated, but we're really led, when I say we're grassroots, we're really led by those members. Um, so we're a 501c6 organization, which is a trade association that's made up of those members. So when they pay in dues every year, they write those off their taxes as an operational expense, just the cost of doing business as being part of this association. Um, and then we obviously not only do technical assistance and um, education and training, but, but advocacy um, and different kinds of program to unlock the voices of our members um, and support them with skills. Um, the slides you're seeing are, uh, many of them are bilingual because our, our members are bilingual. Um, we have about, I think the latest numbers just came out for some, something around 40% of our members are, are Latinx, um, a ma vast majority of whom are Spanish speaking. Um, and, and overall, I think people of color are somewhere between 60 and 65% of our, our membership um, and, and even more in our leadership. So um, we are proudly a, a multiracial group that's really dealing with um, the problems of the racialized wealth gap and, um, and fighting for, for racial equity by using and building a new source of economic power and expanding economic democracy and resiliency along the way. Um, one of the ways that we do that, and thanks for, for um, bringing this slide up, is uh, by creating very intentional spaces. I'll show you the board in a second, but we have uh, four, and last month in our board meeting, we actually just added a fifth um, member council uh, focusing on international work. Uh, but, but these are the four that we've had for, um, for years, for many years now. And uh, you'll see they kind of range uh, between the advocacy work I was starting to talk about. Um, some of our unionized co-ops are participating in our union co-ops council or, uh, or even helping to bridge and liaise with the rest of the labor movement. Um, through that council, they advise sometimes our policy work as pertains to labor or particular industries and sectors. Um, and, uh, and then we have spaces of affinity like our, our immigrant uh, workers council where um, there's trainings, education, um, and sometimes even endorsements of movement uh, platforms. Like in 2017, we endorsed a uh, the, the Sanctuary Restaurants campaign and then actually flipped that and, and decided to mount our own campaign around sanctuary workplaces and broadening that beyond just the, um, the restaurant industry, for example. Um, and then of course, our Regional and Economic Justice Council, um, which all, all these groups advise not only our staff and our programs, but, but our board as well. Do you wanna go into the next slide? Awesome. Oh, you can, wait, what? Okay, go back, there we go, go back one. So this is our team. Um, we've been, when I started, there was just two of us on staff. So we've been growing pretty quickly um, and we're based all over in the South, um, in the Northeast, out in California, um, a little bit in the middle from time to time. Uh, but just to give you a sense of, of the, the faces, the people, maybe you've seen them in your convenings or in other work uh, conferences and things like that. Some of us are here today, um, but it is very relational, the work and the organizing that we that we do. So I wanted to um, bring their faces up. And, and even just by looking at their job descriptions, you get a sense that we're doing everything from uh, building out direct worker benefits, which actually um, ties pretty directly to the work, the, the research and development work we're doing with Gilded. Um, and our, a lot of the consulting or education and training work that we do technical assistance, um, not only to, to, to start new co-ops and do development, um, but also to expand those skills of, of uh, workplace democracy, like what it takes to do group decision-making, conflict resolution, um, even just facilitating spaces um, for, uh, for, for our members. Okay, now you can go to the, 
oh, this might be my last slide. Um, we, these are our board members. Um, most of them are immigrants or, or come from an immigrant background, whether they're first or second generation um, from throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, primarily, though not exclusively. Um, we even have uh, probably about two or three of our board members are monolingual English speakers, and one is a monolingual Spanish speaker. Um, I think we just elected another monolingual Spanish speaker who's going to be joining the board um, at the end of this month. And um, they're all really embedded in their own workplaces. So some of them are founders, some of them work in nonprofits that have been reorganized as um, worker self-directed nonprofits or, or democratic workplaces. Um, and then some of them through our, our programming and leadership development uh, work have even gone on to represent our sector and, and sustainable and regenerative economies in international spaces. So really helping to build out the solidarity economy um, throughout uh, groups like the, the International Worker Co-op Association in the Americas subregion or globally, um, and even just bilaterally building relationships of solidarity um, for people who are doing ethical, sustainable work um, in different industries all around the world. So um, these are some of the folks who power uh, our work and, and also advise me in the work that I'm doing at the helm of the Federation. I think it's up to you next, Sajaka. Is that right? That was my last slide. Awesome. So um, I can maybe tee this up for you a little bit. We've been incubating Gilded um, as a newer initiative, um, just realizing that a lot of the R&D that goes into uh, building out programs for uh, for freelancers to get a better, um, hmm, a better sort of, to have a better platform to engage in um, the gig economy, that a lot of that stuff is really similar to, to especially some of the smaller worker cops that we've been supporting for years. Um, and then also not only the technical side of that, um, but the kind of coalitions and, and, and channels that we've had to learn about and connect members to who often don't initially see themselves as, as having a, uh, a lot of influence on our political system, that we sort of do a lot of that programming and, and, um, and training and cohorting to connect them to people who are making policies, whether that's public policy or, or even in the private sector. Um, and so a lot of that is really similar to the conditions and, and problems that Andrew was mentioning earlier of uh, freelance workers in the US. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you, Ajaka. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had a little moment. I was like, wait, how do I unmute when I'm sharing the screen? But it's resolved. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you for that introduction. I hope uh, that was useful for giving the context for the organization that houses Gilded and showing how much of a labor power economic engine the Federation is and how those pol policies and then the mission transfers very, very um, easily onto what a platform like Gilded could do. So like Angie mentioned, um, we were funded initially by CCI. So that was our, that got us started as an organization with the really powerful vision of how do you address the labor uh, injustices in a segment of labor that isn't really considered labor and like real workers. Cause if you're a freelancer, you're not a real, real worker which means you don't deserve real benefits. But of course, you know, the tools of a couple of decades ago can't always translate into the 21st century. And so we need to be looking for ways to address the real issues. And Gilded is one of those ways using the cooperative model. Um, we're creating a platform, freelancer owned and governed cooperative, which is a business, which means that the freelancers who become members get ownership stake, um, a decision-making power and economic returns as the company grows. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> As the company grows, which, um, and we do that by offering services around contract creation, guaranteed payment, invoicing and payment collections, legally backed worker protections, and worker benefits. So worker benefits being a really huge service, being that there aren't state and federal regulations that set in line the baseline for what uh, freelancers should be entitled to. And regardless of how you view labor law, there's nothing that 
takes away the human, the basic human needs of someone. So it doesn't matter if you classify them as a seasonal worker. It doesn't matter if you classify them as an artist, they still have health needs. They still have social needs. Um, and these should be met in some capacity. So on the left side, you can see the quote, like they take care of clients, we take care of you. And the idea is that platforms have been done several times over and over again for freelancers, freelancers supposedly connecting them to the work. And the idea is the freelancer eventually becomes the commodity. And Gilded turns that up on its head using the tools <laughs> that you might imagine a venture capitalist use in order to make money to say, no, we can use the same technology we can use the same financial levity, financial grace to actually benefit freelancers. And that's exactly what Gilded does. Um, so how did we, oh, so this is one of the um, users of Gilded. She joined because I was looking, I reached out to a couple of people um, in the DC area. This was during the pandemic <laughs> asking, you know, how you, um, what are you doing for uh, freelancing now? Could you short, uh, share your story with me? And she was willing, to first go out <laughs> and take some pics. You can see the face mask is very indicative of 2020, very stylish. <laughs> and also tell us about her experience being um, a poet and a writer. So where did this idea for Gilded arise? So on the one hand, it's a very natural fit with the work that the Federation does in terms of providing, pushing forward worker benefits, pushing forward worker power. And it, because it's such a natural fit, there was an organization based in Europe um, called Smart EU, initially founded in Belgium. Uh, they're a cooperative of over 35,000 members. Oh my goodness, <laughs> uh, my battery is dying. Uh, I'm gonna finish the slide and then run and get my charger, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, they're a cooperative of over 35,000 members and they take freelancers and they convert them to um, full-time employees so that they can get them access to things like a pension, get them access to things like health benefits, um, get them group insurance plans. And they saw, when they first started, they didn't use the cooperative model, but they saw that there was something missing in the services that they were prevent, presenting. And so they came to the Federation to gain a little bit more insight on how do you run cooperatives? What's going on in the US context? Maybe the context, maybe SMART could be adapted to that. And that's how that partnership around um, freelancing came about. So one second, I'm sorry, y'all, I did not. It's okay. I'm gonna and, or you can go. Uh, yeah, I think I can take over the slides. Um, okay. This. Yeah, just pulling. Or you could do the next um, one, <laughs> and I'll be back by then. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah I, I. Okay. Yeah, I thought you might need me to um, run the slides. So um, actually part of part of that collaboration uh, with Smart EU involved, uh, they invited me to come visit them in, in Brussels. And I was, I was there for uh, one of their annual general membership assemblies um, and was able to sort of meet their freelance users and, and also speak on, on one of their panels for their conference. Um, and then after the assembly adjourned, I was able to, to meet people who were operating the platform behind the scenes, um, uh, talk to the people who were providing support to freelancers. So the way that they organize it, you would have almost like a social worker, you'd have a portfolio of freelancers that you were working with and any given, um, uh, what do they call them? It's a associate on staff would maybe have like 100 or 200 people in their portfolio. And then usually they'd be really regularly in touch with about 10% of them who might need help with getting visas or um, licensing, uh, liability insurance to get scaffolding or do a photo shoot or something, um, or just help with navigating some of the, the benefits um, or, or contracts. Um, and then also I, I got to meet some of the legal team. They had uh, several dozen lawyers on staff really powering the, the contracts that they use um, to set up the, these sort of ironclad contracts to ensure that, um, that there isn't wage theft going on for their members. Uh, so I got to learn a bit about that, the platform, and, and even their relationships with the government. I mean, they've, they've reached such a scale um, and proven over the uh, two decades that they've been in operation, uh, proven that they've solved a lot of the of social problems on behalf of the government, that the government gives them giant tax breaks 
they're like, oh, thank God, these people don't need the same kind of support for housing vouchers and food services and all the, you're providing employment. Um, and so that that now is part of a major part of their, their financial um, planning and portfolio. Um, you all you all good, Jaka? Yep. All right, <laughs> back, to, back to Gilded. Um, and so for the services that we offer, the crux, the core of it um, is on the right side of this slide and it's the backend invoicing and the guaranteed payment pool, which we abbreviate as GPP. And we do backend invoicing because of course the life of a freelancer demands that they're both, especially artists, they both are the creator of their artistic work and they have to handle all of the administrative burden of interacting with their clients, making sure their clients are paid, um, and there's been work by JP Morgan that showed that freelancers on average, just looking at their checking accounts, uh, experience dips in their income about 33% of the time. So that's a lot of income volatility that they have to manage on their own, either by over planning or just crossing their fingers and hoping that they can make it borrowing funds for, from friends. We can solve part of that problem as a cooperative and as Gilded, because if once we process a, a contract for a freelancer, part of one of the services we offer is this guaranteed payment, which means if your client doesn't pay on time, if there's a delay, um, if for some reason the bureaucracy is holding you up, Gilded will make sure the front to give the freelancer the money that's owed to them based on their contract on the payment dates that are stipulated in that contract using electronic payment. And this provides both the um, uh, e-paperwork, electronic paperwork for freelancers, which has further ramifications as they go about their career, whether that's taking out a loan, going to acquire more assets, maybe buying a home and showing, showing a proof of income in a standardized way. That's really immeasurable. And so that's why we start there. So what is the core <laughs> need, the financial um, aspect uh, that is, that used to be a hindrance or could be a hindrance for a freelancer. And then we use that because our business model is one where we process contracts and do invoicing for freelancers, but we charge the freelancers clients for those services. And so in paying for the labor, a, free, a client also pays for the social safety net that's needed to protect the freelancer. And then we use our funds co collectively pooled to provide uh, other outer shell benefits. So one of those is tax preparation. And we partnered with one of the members of the US Federation, also a cooperative that does tax preparation in the state and federal level in order to, to offer that to our users. So they have a way to file their taxes, get the most out of their um, refund, which is pretty important because if you're self-employed, you're actually taxed double the regular rate as an as a worker. So not only do you not have benefits, but Uncle Sam is saying, look, you need to pay us more. And you don't have the resources to go and say, okay, let's get a certified um, public accountant to help me with that. So Gilded streamlines that for you. And then we're working on providing a suite of healthcare access. So of course, a lot of the regulation, unfortunately, is built so that if you're not an employee, even as, if you're not an employer, it's really hard for you to provide health benefits. And if you do, the government's going to find you. So we're looking for innovative ways to at least take some of the burden around healthcare off of the shoulders of freelancers. And we do that through partners with local clinics, which give access to primary care clinics. Um, we're doing alternative um, healing modalities. So we're offering stuff around body work. We're offering Jaka, did you freeze just for me? Or is that no, universal? I think it's frozen. <laughs> um, well, she'll be back. Um, I was I was gonna say that in addition to the direct primary clinics and other healthcare access, there's also an organizing opportunity that we've already started um experimenting with, which is getting individual freelancers um to set up an LLC which then does allow them to, um, to sign up for the, the national health plan that we've set up um, as the Worker Co-op Federation through um, an HMO. And um, 
Uh, I'm sure she'll be back. <laughs> um, and also uh, we have a dental plan, we have a vision plan, um, and there's certain states where we where we can connect people to, to health insurance directly. Um, in a lot of states, it's it's not much cheaper than Obamacare. Um, so, but that that is something else that we're working on. Um, I wonder if I can take over screen share. Maybe I'll do that. Um, I think Ajaka was most of the way through these, but let me. Okay. Just loading that. Um, while you're doing that, um, I'll just add one thing, which is so important. Ajaka mentioned that SMART, in retrospect, then organized their services into a cooperative model. And that is something that we have a real affinity and support for. But what we're worried about is that there will be, I mean, this is a, a hot moment for a lot of folks to think about, okay, we understand the failures of our systems. How do we just invent the next thing? And we see a lot of activity around like, let's build this new app, let's build this new tech company, et cetera. We are really mindful. And one of the things that we really like about Gilded is that built into it, not as an afterthought, but as a primary benefit is that this would be worker owned and governed and profit sharing eventually. And so we think that is the kind of solution that would actually fundamentally change a capitalist economy. Right, and that mutualism, right? I mean, when I went to the General Assembly in Belgium, um, it was a meeting not just for them to meet each other and be relational and, and um, share ideas, about the work that they were doing as uh, primarily artists, two thirds of their members are, are in the arts and creative industry, uh, but not exclusively. But also it was the moment for the members to make decisions about what to do with their surplus, how much of it to um, distribute evenly, um, either proportional to hours worked or, um, or how many months you were active in the co-op um, or, and almost every year they've decided to do um, something else, which is reinvest it in the co-op, uh, reinvest it in, um, their internal capital and cash flow uh, funds, or additional services, uh, research benefits and amenities. I mean, they they built maker spaces and um, and other equipment and facilities that are that then become useful for them as freelancers, right? So to get a whole suite of photography equipment and things like that. So I got a chance to visit the ateliers that they had there. Um, those are all choices that can then be made cooperatively um, by the members on a one member, one vote uh, basis. And, um, and it doesn't matter if you've been a member for 17 years or if you just joined that summer, um, you have the same rights and responsibilities as, as every other member there based on cooperative structures. Okay, Ajaka, you're back. Yes, all my tech is against me today. <laughs> Hopefully we can pull through. Um, I think, yeah, you covered that well. The only thing I would add I'm joining on the tail end is that freelancers legally um, yes, please feel free to drop some questions in the chat. Freelancers legally can't organize into a union. So you have a segment of people who can't access, access that structure of organizing. And a cooperative is a really good method for those people who might be left out to get the voices of everyone, um, segment them by sector, and then start making some political and, and political and economic demands. Uh, Oh, can you want me to advance? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully this one doesn't die. It's, <laughs> my fan is working so hard. Uh, so how can Gilded support freelancer power? Um, so like we, I went over in the beginning, um, we provide this structure for material well-being for freelancers. And we do that through our guaranteed payment pool. We do that through the work we provide with contracts, making sure that um, clients are able to, freelancers are getting the best uh, protection for the labor that they're providing their clients. Also ensuring that we're not processing contracts for clients who are actually misclassifying freelancers. Because one thing we don't want to do is to be undermining the labor in and of itself. We, we want to be clear that yes, there is uh, freelance labor, yes, there is employee labor, but the solution is not to mix the two and like misclassify people who are actually employees as freelancers. Um, if you're really a freelancer, Gilded is here to help you and we're not a cover for people who want to, who might wanna use us as that. Um, and what we hope to do is to eventually be able to provide a bird's eye view for the freelance economy, um, 
be able to help others see what's going on, where pu push um, other regulators to start to provide other benefits and protections for freelancers. Because one of the things that Gilded is doing is instead of just talking about whether the structure is needed to help um, gig, uh, gig workers, we're building it. It's here. Like This is what is needed and we're in the process of creating those uh, structures, creating those ties between different businesses, uh, recruiting freelancers and testing it out. And so we're definitely, a, we hope to be a proof of concept that other uh, endeavors like this can work. And then of course, directing resources based on our members as to uh, what freelancer, what other policies and um, movements we should be supporting out there in the field. And I know I'm kind of running out of time. So can we go to, yeah, basically this slide is just showing that because we're a cooperative, we get to decide where the money goes, our workers do. And of course we wanna put it towards the workers and the freelancers as opposed to squirreling, away, squirreling it away in mergers and acquisitions or different stocks that build capital on itself. Um, and Tiffany framed it really well in the beginning, which was so powerful when she's called her firm anti-capitalist. Like there is a way to move capital and be anti-capitalist and it's the intentionality in that that determines. Uh, so these are some numbers, expenses. Uh, how do we plan on reaching financial stability? We have a business plan we're happy to share with you all. Um, essentially, we plan on building out our services. We're starting with contract creation and invoicing, tax preparation, primary care, uh, servicing 1,500 members the first year, and then adding services as we grow our membership and as we grow um, our revenue. And so this shows that we expect to be uh, financial st financially stable by year three, um, and then be able to add on other protections that relate to the outputs of artists and freelancers' work. So things around their product and royalties, IP protections, and then increase the group purchasing power, the group purchasing offer, offerings that we have. And these include things, hopefully, like how great would it be if you're a freelancer, if there was a collective pool for sick and family leave? Because everyone knows you don't have that as a contractor. And so thinking a little bit more visionary as to where we could possibly go with that fund. Um, the other thing to oops, um, the other thing to highlight about this slide is that even though this requires a little bit of um, philanthropic contributions up front to get this operational runway and build things out, once it's up and running, because it's a it's a business ultimately, um, it is self sustaining and financially solvent, right? If there's a rotating pool of capital. Um, according to SMART, they only have a, uh, about 2% of their contracts that go unpaid in any given year, um, uh, but they're able to, the, the admin fees overall kind of cover or subsidize the, um, that, that loss. And, but generally, the, the, the fees on the contracts themselves get you to, that's what these top line numbers are. You know? So by, by year five, it's self-sustaining, meaning not needing any additional financial support or philanthropic support. Um, you've, if you've got something like over 65,000 members, you're looking at over 80 million um, in, according to our projections. And um, uh, yeah, that's just an important thing to, to uh, highlight there. Yeah, and I know we're running out of time. So I, I wanted to a couple of the questions. So our target freelancer target are freelancers based in the art industry first. Um, and then we know as we build our platform for them, we'll be better equipped to serve freelancers across other industries. So people who are project-based, who have contracts for the income that they're bringing in. Um, and this does not mean that a freelancer has to process all their contracts through Gilded. We want them to process the majority or all of them through, because that would help the idea that you're putting into a general pool and if you don't use all the services you're helping equip someone else to be able to have benefits um but yeah there is no we don't go after freelancers if they haven't processed everything there are there is a minimum um in terms of what you process but that's it um so i can't go to all of the questions now but there's the this, these are our funding goals for 2021 to 2023 
Uh, we're looking for to raise funds for guaranteed payment pool with 3.3 million, 3 million for staffing and wages, 2 million to help us uh, with our membership benefits, uh, almost a million for our legal firm retainer and counsel, and 750K for the tech platform, which is going to equip us to handle the large volume of freelancers that we hope to be servicing. Um, and that's our team and advisory board. So I will uh, say before we go to the freelancer, um, I was when I, when I was asked to find a freelancer to speak at this, I had a really difficult decision in part. Um, there was one member that I was really interested in getting, um, but I met her and she got in contact with Gilded at a time when she was considering um, whether or not she wanted to keep her child. And part of the funds that Gilded was able to front to her went into that decision. And I kind of made the decision that it's better um, kind of like this, not wanting to, what's the word, theater, make Black pain more theatrical. I was like, okay, you don't have to do a presentation. I want you to be able to keep your story and I'm going to find um, a different person to present. So uh, <laughs> with that said, just knowing that um, Gilded is, we do serve a whole bunch of different um, freelancers of different sexual orientations and race. But those who are of either LGBTQ, Black, BIPOC, they're undergoing so much more of a strenuous situation when we come in contact with them that their stories, in a way, I think they should have um, the ability to kind of keep it <laughs> and be anonymous. So that's not who I uh, asked to present today. Um, but yeah, so with that uh, further ado, I'm going to call on Justin, if you can, is that correct? <laughs> Say a bit about your work with Gilded. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm um, hearing some echo. Okay, cool. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Justin. Uh, I'm a freelancer, business owner, and fellow cooperator or cooperator based in uh, DC. And uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about my background and then what led me to joining Gilded. Uh, so I've been doing web development, graphic design, audio production, and uh, IT services for most of my life. And uh, projects came in all sizes and shapes uh, you know some were paid some were kind of side projects i never really considered myself a freelancer and, and until really 2017 so uh, up until then was really just doing uh, you know w2 employee life uh, in my professional life and was only familiar with how uh, that system worked and uh, it was pretty easy to navigate there was always an hr team it was actually part of their job to get me all the documents I needed each year uh, for taxes, health care, payments, retirement planning benefits, and you know so on. So after three and a half great years there, uh, the organization restructured. Uh, I didn't find myself in a role there, but I did have a, um, a great family uh, that I, I'm still in contact with. And um, I was at the same time getting asked to do a lot of projects on the side and the stuff that I was already doing and the creative end of things, but never really uh, thought around monetizing that because it was so uh, close to, you know, what I love to do. Uh, and, you, you know, you all heard, <laughs> if you do your passion for your, your work, you might end up hating it. <laughs> but luckily for me, um, that hasn't been the case. But in either case, um, yeah, I figured I would take the leap at that point into uh, freelancing and what that all meant, which I did not know uh, would be as crazy as it, it really is. So um, it didn't really require me to have a system in, in place to manage contracts at the time, uh, the payments, invoices, or taxes. The first two years, I was never actually having clients sign contracts. Um, things were really informal, um, and that was the case for many reasons, but really uh, bad reasons, actually, and, and mostly excuses. And then when it came to tax time, uh, you know, that was a nightmare. But um, I think the, you know, having to um, ask someone that you already trust and know and had built a relationship with, then that wants to have you build a website for them, for instance, uh, you don't, you kind of have that awkward relationship of, do I have them sign something? It feels kind of weird at first. But, uh, and then, you know, if you really need the money, um, you're not getting paid as much as, as you would, you know, it's really hard to justify 
the cost of, of doing work sometimes. So, uh, you, you know, you are worried if they need to sign something, they got to read a bunch of more stuff that they might turn, turn you away. Uh, and these were rational fears at the time. <laughs> and uh, lastly, because I didn't know the value of having a paper trail of the work I did. And that was, yeah, that was just a, a hard thing to learn the hard way <laughs> come tax time. Uh, but by no coincidence, dreaded tax time, uh, you know, April or January rolled around. There was always like, oh, how much would I get back versus, oh my God, I have to go through all my emails, <laughs> all the receipts, <laughs> all the things that I potentially could be missing out on uh, and never knew if the IRS was going to show up on my doorstep at the end of the day. And um, so uh, luckily for me, the finding the, the work was never really a problem because digital services is such a, a need and uh, people want to have an online presence. and uh, so that was never really a problem, but the uh, paperwork and all the administrative stuff that goes into just freelancing uh, was uh, is a nightmare as a you know business owner, as a freelancer. It's a completely different system to navigate and um, and dealing with with uh, clients that you know are not always rational actors. <laughs> um, so when I joined the Gilded Pilot. Uh, the tax team reached out to me. Uh, they pointed out all the things I was doing um, uh, that I didn't know I was doing uh, correctly or wrongly, and uh, got my you know 1099 sorted out when I didn't know if one was required or not. I had subcontracted some things out for a larger project, and uh, you know um, working on scaling and and just kind of proliferating more opportunities as a uh, aspiring co-op and so uh, yeah that was really tough I didn't know if you make above $600 a client has to send you know you have to have a client send you a 1099 and uh, even things like that so the the tax team uh, with Gilda is just amazingly helpful at walking me through that whole process getting me uh, to really look into my receipts the books and and streamlining that whole thing so that uh, the next year tax time was not really scary. It was more like, oh, how much might I get back? <laughs> um, how much, um, yeah, what What are the, the benefits and not be kind of scared of that every year. Uh, and so really um, spent less time on paperwork and also um, made it a smaller deal to clients to have them uh, receive something to sign. and it got me out of that mindset of uh, if it's if it's coming from Gilded, it's actually a lot easier to have someone sign something rather than going directly to them because sometimes there's that, just the one-on-one -on -one can be kind of awkward and just having that built-in, uh, that built-in kind of uh, system in place that you just off the bat, oh, this is how it works. Just, you know, sign the invoice here. Uh, you can pay it there that's been uh, super helpful. And, um, you know, like most freelancers probably uh, have had a couple of horrible clients <laughs> and they've tried to squeeze and, you know, try to squeeze it dry, uh, had no leverage and, and uh, no support at any point. So you're, you're kind of stuck there as a, as a worker. Um, and it's already hard to figure out how to get your next project and you're still trying to get payment from the last project. So uh, definitely a lot of sleepless nights there, but um, having to choose whether they're overdraft on one credit card or another if they weren't gonna uh, hold up their end of the bargain come you know next month to pay rent. Uh, with Gilded, they couldn't wave that check over my head as a worker and kind of ask me for more and more deliverable that was outside of the scope of work that we had actually agreed on. So uh, for me, that that peace of mind is priceless and uh, we'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Can, can I just jump in really quick? Because I want to tease a couple of things that also came up in the chat. And maybe my single response will uh, under, or respond to some of them. So they, so we're an arts funder. That's not exactly why Gilded only started out focusing on art, the arts. And in fact, SMART in the EU, the model of which this is built on, it's got the name smart with the word art in it because they actually built this for the arts industry first and foremost. And then they expanded it to other freelancers. 
So we're taking a page from their book because in many ways, artists are uh, basically the kind of um, model, that's not quite the right word, of what gig workers, a growing number of them are facing. So to build and design and uh, offer it first and foremost to a very specific labor segment is a, just a strategic decision for the startup mode, but it does not mean that this is where they're gonna end up. Just like in the EU, SMART is now serving freelancers of all different industries. So if you got the breakdown, you would mostly see arts folks right now, but that's not the, uh, the objective. And then I wanna underscore, there's a difference in my mind between Gilded competing with a number of other uh, platform or apps-based services that are right now out there to serve freelancers. There is competition, but there, you know, we already talked about the cooperative model, the profit sharing, et cetera, that's going to distinguish it. But what I would really say is as someone that's coming from the charitable sector, providing um, support is that it's the, the gilded model is unique in being the one that is meant to so solve a social problem that freelancers of all types have. And so Emily, to your question of, do you have to run contracts through Gilded? It really doesn't behoove a freelancer or Gilded for them not to start with Gilded first and foremost, because all contracts, once a freelancer gets a client, they're actually supposed to just say, okay, I'm ready. Here's the contact information. Here's the scope of work. And then Gilded handles the entire contracting per, uh, process. And then it makes it of course easier for invoicing, et cetera. But what that means is, if someone becomes a non-payer as a client, Gilda's legal team goes after non-payers, right? And that's and for the freelancer, they they just tell Gilda, they don't even bother telling the client. They tell Gilda, my project is done, and they automatically get paid. It's possible in this country to solve wage theft among freelancers as a labor class through Gilded. So I just want to make sure we understand the difference between a great service product and solving a social problem, which I think it, Gilded does both. That was brilliantly put. Thank you, Angie, for catching that and for clarifying. Great. Yeah, thank you everyone. And um, thanks for kind of sticking with us through this presentation. We wanted to give you a chance to go into some little breakout groups. We find that helps people generate questions around what's coming up for you, get a little chance to connect with each other. And also, if you generate some questions, you can talk about have you funded infrastructure? Like, what is the role of infrastructure in kind of building an economy that works for everyone? And so I'm going to open the rooms. I'm going to give you all five minutes. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll have another kind of 10 minutes to close where we'll do some Q&A. Uh, thanks, everybody. And I can leave, I could give us some music too, if you want for this <laughs> interlude. Oh, did everybody go? Usually people are so non-compliant. Let's see. Looks like people mostly went. I'm non-compliant. I'm sorry to tell you, this is Abby. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. You're welcome to stay in here. <laughs> Mainly because I'm just way too tired to be compliant with anything. So <laughs> that's fair. It gave me a little time off, but I do want to say this has been really interesting and it's really exciting. If you have any questions, you have all of us. You have the whole panel to yourself. <laughs> no, like maybe this was the smart choice. <laughs> I know it's kind of the, the dream team in here. Yeah. Well, let me ask. It looks like it's about $10 million you're looking to raise in philanthropic money. Like, have you started raising that? Or where are you looking for that? And how are you being received for it? Savannah, do you want to take that one or should I? Or Jekka? Why don't you take it? I was just I was just conversing in the chat. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so far, so good. I mean, we really are already have so much momentum, like more than we thought we would at this point, uh, which is great. 
a lot of it has been for uh, the, the the staffing and and operational costs for building out um, the platform, doing some R and D, um, and and just organizing so marketing and outreach. Uh, but we also we also have started to capitalize this guaranteed payment pool, um, and so there's enough there. We haven't yet come up against the. I'm sure at some point we'll have the problem of saying, oh no, we have to front more money than we have in our guaranteed payment pool, uh, but we're not there yet. We're, we've been able to cover um, all of that, that cash flow for, for paying out to freelancers first. Um, and as we do more outreach and onboard more users, um, it is gonna increase the, the need for us to capitalize that pool. So, so far so good. Yeah, we do have a, um, a lot more that we wanna, um, uh, close in on over the next couple of years for that guaranteed payment pool. Um, we haven't hit a million yet, I think, but we've been probably pretty close to a million for the fundraising just in the last six months so far. We're closing in on 850,000 right now. Right. There we go. Right. 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 And, and where does it come from? I mean, are there, is it foundations or individuals or who is really lit up by this? Who's lit up is everybody. <laughs> we have like journalists who are like, "Can we do a feature?" And we're like, "We're, we're really still, you know, uh, in early stages." But uh, yeah, the contributions are mostly from foundations. Some of them are um, national or are have a geographic focus that's in a particular city or state, um, or they have a certain um, focus area, which might be about institution building, like Kate was just saying. Um, it might be about uh, working with artists and, and creatives, uh, or it might be about, you know, that, that vexing problem of how do you organize unorganizable workers. Uh, but that's right. just a sense of where some of the funding has come from so far. Right, right, right. And we're this just starting to get some individual contributions. It's like just beginning. Are you, space. are you getting pushback from unions? To, um, do they, do they see this kind of thing as a threat? No, I mean, it, it really complements and it's why, part of why I was trying to, um, to introduce the work that we do collaboratively with unions and, and our union co-ops council that, that advises our work. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, the biggest question is how do you organize these people? And then, and then how, if you're in the same industries, which could be building trades or transportation, you know, what are those opportunities for mutualism, for, you know, getting in on the same agenda? Right. Um, if anything, the unions are sort of like, oh, independent contractors, freelancers, they're over there, go right. talk to, and we end up, we end up in conversations with other um, alt labor groups, like the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the Restaurant Opportunity right. Center, uh, Freelancers Union, obviously, groups like that. Right, right, Some right. worker centers. I'm yeah, I'm asking because I'm in the middle of and almost done with a film that was started by my um, vocal objections to the way workers were treated at Disneyland. Mm. Um, and I've used it as a jumping off point to talk sort of in general about the last 50 years for the American worker and why it has happened that way and why you have people who donate to the Democratic Party who are also enforcing some of the most grievous labor conditions like you you know that it, it's insane and the unions don't always serve them well um I and I know that there's right. a, there's this it, they're in an incredibly delicate position um because their power has been shaved back by right. right to work laws and and corporations essentially treat them as you know dirt um, and I know that they're working and acting for the most part in good faith, but, you know, I've also seen the Teamsters throw SEIU under the bus and I've right. seen that too. It, and you um, get well, from a lot Abby, of things. Oh, Abby sorry. Can, I just, well, we only have like eight minutes left oh, okay. and I kind of, I was like, we're not going to answer any of the questions until we hold the Q and A time. So there's a lot of- Can I finish the question that's just really quick? Um, the, what you get from most people is strengthen unions, get people to join unions. Is that our future? Um, or are you tr looking to, meant to create a different kind of a future with this effort? Well, freelancers really don't and can't unionize. Yeah. 
So yes. as we saw from um, the federal response in the CARES Act to just COVID, it was actually the first time in our in modern history that the federal government actually acknowledged and did something yeah. to include freelancers. So yeah. that just goes to show it's a big open space to figure out infrastructure for freelancers, both political power and services. Right, right, right. Sorry, sorry about that, Tiffany. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody to the q and It We kicked it off early because not everybody got assigned to a group. So that's what you were coming back into as a conversation. Um, but yeah, just wanted to open it up and it's kind of brief. So if people can focus on a concise question that we can put out to our people and then everything else will be, I don't know, this is the beginning of a relationship. And so I'll, I'll send a follow-up email. And I think that everybody at Gilded and the Federation will be really excited to be in touch with everybody. So it's not limited to this time. Um, I don't wanna pick on you, but Allison, I feel like I saw that you had a question earlier on. Did it get answered? It did, it actually okay. was answered. Awesome, nice to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Zoe, go for it. Cool. Um, I just, this may be obvious, but um, if you could just explain a little bit more how it becomes self-sustaining, that would be amazing. Yeah, so uh, basically in bulk, like at volume, we're able to get enough, earn enough revenue from the 6.5% overhead, assuming that we and this was done in our business plan that we have a percentage of uh, freelancers earning about like a certain amount and a certain uh, per month and a percentage earning a bit higher. Uh, we're able to provide uh, services to uh, group services in terms of the healthcare offerings that we do have and the tax preparation. And that's assuming a 50% utilization. So all of this is based on um, what is the volume of contracts we expect to be processing, what's the breakdown between the freelancers that we're processing, larger contracts versus smaller, and then what percentage of utilization. Um, so basically we expect that the overhead is gonna allow us to be able to uh, fund our operations. And the, and the overhead is the piece that Gilded is charging when they're generating the contract. So like when the freelancer is working with Gilded and they're making that contract, if they're charging $100,000 in that contract, there'd be an additional like 6,500 that the, the um, corporation or the organization is paying that goes to Gilded as, along with the 100,000 that would go to the freelancer. Did I get that right? Yes, yes exactly. exactly. And part of that Thanks. sustainability. Oh, go ahead, Esteban. No, I said yes, exactly at the same time as you. <laughs> um, part of that sustainability, like um, Esteban mentioned, that is that guaranteed payment pool when we're able to, we have enough funds where we're also able to do the fronting um, to freelancers without having to say, oh no, we're going to get negative in our balance because that's part of our operation expenses, even though it's a revolving fund. Uh, yes, Kate, that means we won't need to depend on philanthropic investments once we're self-sustaining. Yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> we And we did, in our business plan, we sort of tinkered with different models for what would uh, dues contributions be annually or per project or per year and things like that. Um, but uh, setting all of that aside, we did land on the six and a half percent as the um, the fee that wouldn't really touch or garnish any of the wages of the freelancers themselves, but be charged to the corporation or the clients. Did you have another question, Zoe? No. I guess just as a follow-up to that, is there yeah. any is there any issue early on with um, with uh, I, I suppose that's what you're talking about with competition, but with clients choosing to contract workers who don't, who they won't have to pay that charge with. Um, so has there been, I'm gonna repeat it to make sure I understood, has there been any pushback from clients who don't wanna pay? Right. Yeah, 
Um, no, I think the only, the main pushback that we've seen is when freelancers bring their contract too late. So they might bring it to us in the middle of it and say, hey, by the way, could you rip something up for me? I've already been paid half of what I'm owed. I'd like to process it through Gilded because then it gets a bit confusing. We would have to write an addendum. We'd have to introduce Gilded. Um, but for freelancers that we start working out with and we're able to make that initial contract uh, has been smooth. There might be questions about what we are, but uh, after explaining it and walking through the process, um, we haven't had that much pushback. Well, cool. Emily, you want to ask a question? It might be moot. Does this mean that payment then from client to freelancer actually like runs through Gilded? Yes, exactly. You see, that also helps clarify, Andy, some of the really powerful points you were underscoring earlier. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. <laughs> and, and in Europe, what they did was because of that flow and that relationship, they just turned the freelancers into employees. They actually turned them into what the equivalent would be of W-2 employees and then connected them to government benefits because you get a better set of social benefits if you're employed versus if you're free, an independent worker. So that was their workaround there. In the market in the US, it's just way too complicated and different enough that, um, and we considered it and researched that uh, with the support of some um, of that initial grant from CCI. And we found that it would probably be best to, to maintain it this way. We do have friends, partners, uh, members of the Federation who, who do turn the freelancers into employees. Um, core staffing does this uh, type part of the Oberon co-op. Um, and that's, that's a little more of what their model is. Well, we have like one minute left. I feel like we should just use it to wrap up and end promptly at 2.15 Pacific. Um, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who made the time to come. Like I started, we really were like just moving on spirit. It felt so right to like respond to uh, the initial inspiration that we had when we learned about Gilded. And so thank you everyone from Gilded who presented and made this happen. And thank you all to you for contributing. We'll send um, a follow-up email that is like a folder that was um, created to support people and having all the information that you need to both like have a snapshot of Gilded and then also to stay in touch and also to um, resource this. Literally when I learned about this, I was like, oh, you need $10 million and 9 million of philanthropic capital. Hold on, let's. <laughs> let's shoot for the stars and try. So um, yeah, thank you so much for participating in this beautiful experiment and we'll see you later. Bye. Thanks so much y'all, have a good night. Thank yeah, you. Thank everyone. you. Thanks Esteban, thanks Ajaka. Thanks thank everybody. You.